Dr. Carolyn Zachary, the Director of uh, Adult Education at CDE. Good afternoon and uh, welcome to my remote outside workspace. It's a lovely day here in Northern California, so I opted to move my workspace outside. Uh, I'm battling a little bit of the pollen, but uh, it's nice to be outside. So next slide, please. I hope that you're ready as we move into this uh, era of remote testing. A couple of, the, couple of areas we want you to make sure that you understand is that we are following all of the NRS guidelines that they have laid out as it relates to uh, testing, as well as OCTA's guidelines and their um, uh, requirements. If you do decide to move into remote testing this year, you're going to need to amend your local assessment policy, and that's going to need to include the use of a remote testing agreement form that you will identify the tests and the co-apps that you're going to administer remotely. This would also include an assurance that you will follow all of the remote testing requirements and that all staff are trained to administer remote assessments. A template will be available for agencies to use by the end of next week. Now we do know that many of you may not be able to do some of this remote testing. And so we will in TE, you'll see that there is a um, area that can be checked called unable to test. Don't check that yet. Um, this is going to be used probably at the end of this grant year. And we'll be developing a policy as to how that is going to be used for all of our agencies. We know that Octa is very interested in this data and we'll be including that, those numbers within our annual report narrative that is sent to Octa so that uh, they can see where, uh, how the impact was on California. Next slide, please. All right, payment points. I know everyone's interested in payment points. So, the first thing I want you to do is breathe. Take a deep breath and relax. We know at CDE that this is a big concern. We don't have the right answer just yet because we haven't looked at the data or know the true impact of what COVID-19 is having on our adult agencies in California. We will have a better idea of that in the early fall. Once you have submitted your data to CASAS and it's been certified, we'll be able to sit down as an office and look at the data. We'll look at past data from every agency. We'll look at trends and then we will make a decision. Our goal is to not have COVID-19 negatively impact any agency because you weren't able to have students um, te be tested. However, as we move into this idea of remote testing, for those of you that are in, that go on, down this road with us, um, I really want you to focus on your students and how they're succeeding in this new learning environment. And use the co-app, remote co-apps, and the SIT test, and then on uh, Monday we'll learn more about pre and post testing. Use that to help your students see their growth. And so the teachers can also see the growth so that they know that their students are learning in this new remote environment. Next slide, please. I do want to remind you that on Monday, we do have two webinars similar, today, similar to today that will be focusing on CASAS pre and post testing. And also, I do know that in our remote areas, um, doing, doing online school in a distance learning format is challenging. And so Penny is going to be putting into the chat um, information on Rachel devices that can help with connectivity. And you can use these with the co-apps. We're not sure yet about pre and post testing, but this could be a way for those of you in a remote area to be able to um, have students complete their co-apps. So look for that information in the chat and certainly send me questions that you might have 
I'll be helping to monitor the Q&A section as well. And now I'd like to turn it over to Pat Rickard, president of CASAS. Thank you, Pat. Thank you, Carolyn. We wanna thank you all for joining us this afternoon and to learn more about remote testing. We're very excited to share with you what we have learned, what we are doing, and what we will continue to do to support you in the implementation of remote testing. We do have more to learn. Um, as we go up down this uh, pathway uh, to remote testing, uh, we learn th new things every day and we're learning a lot from you. We really want to thank those of you who very willingly agreed to pilot test um, and provide feedback for us. And Linda will tell you more about um, pilot testing, additional pilot testing, if you're willing to do it. I do want to say that this effort is not just for COVID-19 and that we'll all go back to, in quote, normal um, in the new year. I think that the remote learning, remote instruction, along with remote assessment is the new normal. I think that what we're doing right now is we're building capacity for now, but also in the future. We will have the capacity then to serve more students, um, serve those that may not be able to come to our programs. So this effort um, during the last quarter of this year is not just an effort um, between now and June 30th. If you really think about it, it's an opportunity to build capacity at the agency level, the program level, and with staff to be able to um, provide instruction remotely and also to test remotely. So I really wanted to emphasize the capacity building opportunity that we have. Um, with that, I'll turn it over to Linda and Linda's going to give you um, more detail for EL Civics, both with the co-apps and the SIT. Over to you, Linda. Okay, thank you, Pat. Hello, everyone. Um, it's nice to have this opportunity to share with you what we're doing uh, with remote testing at CASAS today. Uh, let's go to the next slide, Nita. <clears throat> so this uh, is an agenda that uh, shows what we're gonna cover. <clears throat> Excuse me, we're, uh, today we're going to focus on EL Civics, um, the co-apps and SIT. Uh, Monday, we're going to get into the pre and post testing and EL Civics. Uh, so that is um, how we've divided it up. And uh, just, I know you all are very eager to hear about the pre and post testing. So I hope you can be patient on that. Um, and there may be other things that uh, we need to cover on, on Monday as well that come up in the chat box today so we can see. But today we're focusing on the co -ops and SIT. We'll have a chance to uh, answer your uh, questions. Um, we'll try to keep up with the Q&A box, but um, as uh, sometimes the questions can come fast and furious, we don't know if we'll get to all of them, but we assure you that we will uh, review all of the questions that came in and uh, whatever we uh, get, we will create a document where we compile them all and answer them, uh, the, both the ones we've answered and the ones that we haven't. So um, please uh, be patient with us if we can't get to everyone today. We're over 200 people on the call already. So first we're gonna do an overview. And I wanna back out a little bit um, to get a national view of this situation. And I think the most important thing to understand about all of this is that in a way, we're all in this together, including the U.S. Department of Ed, uh, Office of Career Technical and Adult Ed, that's OCTE. Um, they realize that this is an unusual situation and they have very openly and clearly stated that um, they're allowing testing flexibility to the states. So uh, they, they know that you're not gonna be able to test every single student by any means. And so that, that is something they made clear in a memo on April 17th. Um, where they said that uh, states may allow programs to exempt students from pre-post testing, and that's what Carolyn was talking about earlier. 
and that there would be a specified time frame for that. So um, this is happening, as you well know, it's all over the country and um, they're aware that you're not able to do what you normally do. Um, they also made some uh, provisions and some recommendations for everyone to be aware. Uh, this was on their March 27th memo that um, if uh, remote testing is to occur with the NRS approved tests, they of course are standardized and must be uh, respected as such. So um, there are uh, areas that uh, it's very important for those who choose to do the pre-post testing once that's uh, available um, to make sure that you do follow the protocols for the student ID, identifying and authenticating the student ID, um, anything related to test security, and that takes a lot of forms with this, but um, we'll be covering some of them. And then training, because uh, doing uh, testing in a remote mode does require additional know-how, and that's something that would is required for even though proctors may already be certified in our e-tests or whether it's in co-ops, whatever they may be uh, certified for, they are not yet certified in how to do this remotely. And so we need to provide them additional training and support. So more of this will be covered on Monday, but just wanted to give you this sense of the a feeling really of the national picture. Um, and uh, uh, if we can go to the next slide. Um, on April 9th, Octa met with all of the test publishers and um, briefed all of us about what they had in mind, which is some of what I just shared with you. And then following that, uh, not very long after, about a week and a half later, uh, Casas met, uh, just Casas met with Octa. And um, during that time, we were able to frame and develop a plan to uh, provide remote testing. Um, and when we presented that to Octe, they gave us permission to roll it out. And actually they were quite impressed with our plan and our timeline. So we were pleased about that. And um, I would say there's been a considerable amount of work that we've done. It's been uh, a lot to learn in a short period of time. And it's an opportunity to, uh, I think, do something that we've all wanted to do, but we, um, we felt that uh, it, it would be too challenging, but now we're put in a position where we really want to make it available and we're trying to balance how we can do it uh, quickly and yet keeping the precautions that are necessary to uh, protect the security of our tests. Um, on April 20th, we pulled together the state directors from all the, uh, 30 states actually, where they use CASAS and we uh, briefed them on our plan and it is in phases and we um, you know we're able to uh, explain to them and we we have now I would say about uh, 15 states or so that have been involved already in piloting so um, they are eager and um, we're very excited that there's so much uh, responsiveness to this let's go to the next slide <clears throat> So what are the benefits of remote testing? And here we're gonna hone in uh, more on EL Civics. And some of these points were already mentioned by uh, Dr. Zachary and by Pat, but I'll just go over some of them in a little bit more detail. And it's basically good for students and good for teachers because uh, when they're doing distance learning, they still want to be able to see their progress and, and check the progress of learners. So to get started with remote testing is an opportunity to, to assess students who recently completed a significant chunk of learning. It gives them feedback, uh, both students and teachers get feedback and keeps students engaged. Um, they, know, they can know that uh, at the end of their 30 hour block of co-op instruction that they're going to be tested. And, you know, I think often they're very motivated to demonstrate that. <clears throat> um, so uh, as Pat mentioned, uh, we really hope that you can very productively use this time uh, to build capacity at the local level um, 
by establishing procedures for remote testing, by training staff, just thinking through how it can be done. Uh, I'm sure as you get into it, you'll come up with really great ideas about how to do it and eventually um, even get more and more efficient at it. So um, now is the time to explore. And uh, just as you've, uh, I'm sure, learned a lot from uh, distance learning uh, and grown about that in the last eight weeks or so, um, this is now a time to put attention on how to assess. And, and I also imagine that many of you have been uh, putting your toes in the water of, of assessment already informally with distance learning, whether uh, with the materials you're using or just uh, teachers figuring out ways to, um, to monitor progress informally. So I'm sure that there are going to be a lot of great ideas already about remote testing. So this is a time to get prepared for the future and to really, in a way, redefine our programs as uh, blended and uh, doing as much distance learning uh, as we can as a regular part of the program's offerings. <clears throat> we've um, been very pleased that we've had a lot of interest from agencies that want to pilot. And uh, so that's really helped us to um, develop and frame the guidelines that we uh, have been creating. And just you know, to say that uh, I don't think this is going away. Uh, remote testing is the wave of the future for distance learning and uh, any learning has always been a basic CASAS principle that it takes curriculum assessment and instruction all together to make it work. So we, uh, are, we now have an opportunity to build in the assessment part of that triangle. So what are some of the challenges of remote testing? Uh, I think we've all come to realize more acutely even than before, as Carolyn was saying, that equity concerns are there and um, our students, many of them don't have access to technology or very limited. Uh, that relates to what devices they have or what kind of bandwidth. And um, now with uh, lockdown all over the country, uh, in any home environment, it could be um, that there are many people competing for that limited bandwidth, whether it's people working from home or kids doing distance learning uh, as part of their schoolwork. So um, our students are also competing for that. And if they have to set up a time to do an assessment, then that's a time when they're going to hopefully want to have the as, mu as much bandwidth as they can get a hold of. So you might need to work with them on when that's the best time. Uh, their home environment is definitely going to be a challenge for some. Uh, they may not have privacy. It may be very busy and full of distractions. So that's something we'll learn more and more about. Again, you've probably learned something about that from their distance learning um, efforts. But um, this is where, you know, for testing, they're going to want to be able to focus in. And um, we need them to uh, not have things available to, to help. So um, that's something we're going to have to be uh, keenly aware of and, and probably, again, come up with some creative solutions. Um, with remote testing, we have these new procedures for training our assessors. Uh, as Carolyn mentioned, we are working on a, a remote test uh, agency agreement where uh, we'll ask you to have read the guidelines and um, agree to uh, protect the security of the tests and the privacy of our students and other things. Um, this will be an agreement that's uh, for all of the different tests that we're going to be uh, making available for remote testing. And then this is something that we don't normally have to do because we normally have the students face to face with us. But uh, in this new um, environment where they're at a distance, we will need uh, to ask them to agree not to share test items, not to share the uh, assessment um, uh, information. Uh, and that's something that we are planning to ask them to do orally uh, as, as part of the assessment upfront. Then uh, test security is um, 
of course, so important. Uh, you can imagine it's important for us, but it's, of course, important to you as well because you've done so much work to develop these co-ops and you don't want them compromised. So, um, you know, especially for the SIT, I would say, though, because it's a standardized test, there are only two forms. And um, so we need to be really very cognizant of uh, the kind of test security that we are uh, requiring and making sure that it's adequate to meet the needs. So how did we go about this? Uh, we talked to CDE, of course. We talked to consortium leaders. We talked to agencies. We interviewed practitioners who are familiar with the co-ops, with SIT, and with distance learning. We made, we, we, we weighed multiple factors, um, some of which I just talked about, but really uh, a few additional ones. Um, one is how easy will it be for you to adapt, especially the co-apps for remote testing, that is the, um, the assessment delivery part of the co-apps, um, the test security concerns, how easy will it be to implement. We know you don't have much time to the end of the year and um, so there, there are questions about how easy it will be also in terms of the devices, et cetera, and the processes. Um, we know there's some urgency uh, to start up quickly, so we are being as responsive as we possibly can to get these um, guidelines and um, supports out to you quickly. Um, and uh, of course, there's also the, the question of access to technology as, as one of the things as to how we can frame the guidelines. Test security measures. Uh, in a way, um, not in a way, we really have always uh, relied on local agencies to be responsible for test security. Uh, when you agree to do any kind of testing, you are also agreeing to uh, keep uh, all the test materials secure and to make sure that the testing is proctored appropriately. So uh, with remote testing, it's no different. In fact, it's really heightened because uh, there are additional concerns and there are additional challenges. So uh, we do rely on you, we're counting on you to be responsible about this and to take all appropriate measures to ensure test security. These remote testing agreements, um, the, the agency one is just one per agency and that will cover all of the different assessments, as I said. Um, there will be, uh, for the SIT, um, a special, a separate one for test administrators to sign uh, that has some specific agreements about uh, test security and privacy with remote testing, um, also for the co-apps. And then for students, as I mentioned, we'll be asking them to agree to some things at the time of testing. So how will this be delivered and what's the process? Basically, um, we are going to ask you if, if you want to participate. Now, this is an optional um, thing. This remote testing is, is not something that's required, but it's available as, as something you can explore and try out. And um, I want to just say about co-apps that uh, we are not going to ask you to revise your plan. The P of co-apps is for plan, as you all know. Um, so that is not part of this process. The plan will stay intact, but what we are going to ask you to look at and adapt if needed is the assessment procedures or the assessment delivery in those additional assessments. So you need to look at the ones that you had um, said you were going to do this year, decide uh, which ones are uh, those that uh, are actively being used where the students are getting uh, or likely to get the 30 hours they need. Uh, decide how um, practical, feasible it may be for each one of them and then uh, decide which ones you think you might tackle, one or more, uh, to do remote testing. And then um, decide about the technology that you think would be appropriate for those. Um, and the good thing and the reason we're able to even this quickly roll out the co-ops and sit um, in a, is that they can be delivered in low tech format. So that's something that um, is actually quite fortunate and that enables us to go forward right now. So 
Um, and we will want you to be using your existing assessors, uh, but you'll need, as we said, to give them additional training in this remote mode. Now again, a little more about the test environment. Um, you're going to want, as, to the best of your ability, to ensure that the student's alone and not getting help. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm sure that you all do uh, explain clearly to your students what is the purpose of the assessment. And if they do understand that, uh, I think most of our students are not that likely to want to cheat. Um, they know that they're trying to show what they can do and that um, they, uh, you know, there's not really much benefit in it for them. But I think we do have to take these precautions. But I, again, I think if, as always, you explain the purpose of testing, uh, they're not very likely to go astray. Um, what, uh, certainly for the SIT, and we'd uh, ask you also for the co-apps whenever possible, um, depending on the technology you're using, um, you might ask the student to sweep the room with the video camera, which would probably be their smartphone, uh, before and after the test session to see if there are any other people there or any items that shouldn't be there uh, related to this testing. So uh, that's the recommended um, uh, precaution to take for uh, to assure test security. And then accommodations will, uh, those that have been in place will remain. But in addition, we are thinking that uh, there may be some uh, uh, new ones that emerge as uh, students are in their home environment. Uh, there may be some uh, additional kinds of accommodations that come up. And so you can, um, uh, you know, if you have questions about what's uh, allowable, um, you can always talk to your program specialist and uh, get some guidance. But uh, that's something that we'll be seeing as, as this unfolds. So what about cost? Uh, we don't think this is going to be a heavy lift for you. We think it'll be a minimal cost for local program staff to uh, review your co-apps. That is, I'm going to refer to co-apps, but I'm actually talking about the assessment delivery part of them and to decide which ones you can deliver remotely and adapt them. Um, and see if you can uh, reasonably train your co-app assessors. Um, as far as the SIT goes, we think, again, it'll be minimal cost. Uh, you'll need to use your certified SIT test administrators, so those, um, the existing ones that you already have in your program, but then you'll need to make sure they read the guidelines and set them up for remote testing. And I'm gonna get into a lot more about that in the second part of uh, this webinar. So this is um, a, a description of the different phases that we um, are working in. It's simple, they're just two. But uh, just to be clear that right now we're in phase one and that's where we're doing clinical tryouts and pilots of these remote uh, co-apps and with the SIT. So we have involved about 15 agencies or so, so far. It's been extremely helpful to get their feedback. We're incorporating their uh, comments as we uh, learn from them. So um, that, and also now during this time frame, we are figuring out uh, what this um, remote test center agreement should look like and finalizing that. So I just want to be clear that that um, agency test, uh, remote test center testing agreement is not available yet. Uh, we will make every effort to get that out to you as soon as we can, but it probably won't be till uh, late next week until it's all finalized and ready to go. Uh, it needs to uh, apply to all the different uh, modes of testing remotely. So uh, please be patient for that, but as soon as it's available, we will let you know, and then that will enable you to uh, signal your, in your intention to do remote testing. We are planning on May 11th to roll out or to, to allow you to roll out remote testing both for co-apps and the SIT. And so um, on, before that, we're, we're working our, uh, as fast as we can to get these uh, support materials uh, ready, uh, including training, which I'll be talking about in a minute. So um, that is the uh, projected timeline. So in terms of that agency remote testing agreement, um, one per agency, we would ask you to submit it to your 
uh, program specialist and to your CDE regional consultant. Um, it would cover all of the different tests that are going to be available for remote testing. Um, and then uh, it includes all these agreements for test security and privacy and um, it'll be something that you would uh, just keep on file along with your local assessment policy. Uh, in that, we'll also ask you to give us um, what is your estimated start date to do this. All right, so now we're going to um, delve into co-apps uh, in particular. So the first thing to say, and hopefully this comes as good news, is that we think that most of your agency's um, uh, assessment deliveries of your in your co-apps is going to be possible uh, to use uh, possibly as is um, or modified uh, slightly for remote testing and that would be with your with computers with smartphones or even lower tech than that so we we think that it's going to be uh, something that's quite doable um, the thing that is very important is that you should be able to interact in real time that is live with the student or students. And uh, I will say that um, with co-apps, uh, you may be able to, um, to assess more than one student at a time. We are going to ask you to start one-on-one -on -one and get good at it and then move into uh, what would be a little more challenging to um, proctor more than one student, but um, some of the assessment modes, particularly if it's a, if it's a written response, uh, you may be able to um, be able to, to effectively monitor more than one at a time. But I would say in general, you should not have the expectation with remote testing that you're going to do a whole class at a time. That is just not possible because you do need to uh, be able to observe the student. And so there are limitations to the uh, number of students you can do uh, work with at a time. And uh, of course, uh, these uh, co-op assessments are applied performance. They're, they're performance assessment. And so that's the beauty of them. That's how they're so relevant to what you're teaching. Um, and it uh, is then required for you to be able to observe and really see them demonstrate um, their skills. Now, uh, this is perhaps a little overwhelming, but I'm going to walk you through this chart. Um, across the top, we're, we're looking at what are the types of technology, that is, which devices and which platforms uh, can be used for co-apps. And so you can see we tried to order this from low to high tech. Uh, not extremely high, but at least uh, in terms of our student population. <laughs> so the lowest would be a phone or um, just a phone. So that is possible. Uh, I think uh, we would prefer a smartphone because then there can be the video interaction. Um, so hopefully that is what you can manage to uh, have the student have as a smartphone where you can see them. But a phone uh, is possible with some of the oral only if you see on the left hand side, you can see the different modalities. So if the assessment delivery of a co-op is just oral, then you may be able to simply have a phone conversation and again, preferably a phone, uh, smartphone where you can see the person. Um, if it's a written um, assessment delivery, then paper and email. Again, we want the camera because we want to be able to see the student uh, writing. Uh, but um, making sure that they didn't get it passed to them by somebody else or, you know, that they're writing in real time. But uh, that's certainly something you could observe and that they could share with you. Um, so a text or email as well, that could be uh, even more real time where they're, they're actually using WhatsApp and texting the answers as you ask them or any, any we're going to talk about the, the platforms in a minute. Um, a smartphone with a, a camera that where you can see them uh, with camera and Zoom would be another level up. Um, if they have an iPad, tablet, Chromebook, or computer, okay, great with Zoom. And then, you know, a higher level would be a Windows 10, but not needed at all for these. <clears throat> so then, and then the modalities could be, um, you know, a combination of oral and written. Uh, role play is something you can do with them remotely. Um, 
than portfolios. Uh, we feel you can do them. Um, you'll need to be, you know, very uh, particular and careful about how they submit, what they do, and and uh, and where. But um, that is potentially something you can work out the details for and pull it off. Um, and of course, listening and written is another possibility. So we uh, don't we don't think this list is exhaustive. You may come up with other permutations and combination combinations of these devices and platforms. But we just wanted to give you an idea of how it all fits together with the uh, co-ops. And we gave some sample uh, co-op assessment deliveries there where you can see how they uh, might play out with these different modes of technology. So this is just to let you know that there is a document that's called Remote Testing Guidelines for Co-ops. It's still in the works, but it's quite far along. So uh, we really do hope to get it out to you next week. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> now here, uh, I know most of you are probably familiar with going live with ETES, which is our onboarding process for ETES. Uh, this is the comparable process for going remote with the co-op. So uh, we've tried to lay out some of the steps uh, that, and some of them we've kind of uh, introduced already, but I want to go into a little more detail here. So first of all, and this is in, when you roll out, um, you'll want to consider which of the uh, assessment deliveries of co-ops you want to um, select for remote testing, and if necessary, adapt them. So you'll need to very carefully review the co-op guidelines for remote testing <clears throat> and see, according to those guidelines, what's possible, doable. Then you'll um, get into revising the, the co-op assessment delivery as needed. Again, not the plan, but the assessment delivery. Uh, decide what technology might be required, and that could perhaps uh, eliminate some or, or modif make you modify how you deliver it. Um, determine how you're going to verify student identity if in some cases I imagine it's not the teacher who's um, the assessor. If, if that's the case, then you'd need to have a process for that. And we are going to um, uh, basically leave it to your local agency's process that you normally use to verify student identity, and it does vary across the state. So uh, whatever you're using now, uh, you'll need to figure out how to adapt that process for the remote context. <clears throat> then there may be also some things you need to consider about documenting the results. Uh, if you've used paper in the past and file folders, you'll have to think about that there's some kind of an electronic document that now has to be sent somewhere and stored somewhere. So those are things that you're going to have to decide on and then um, make it very clear to all the assessors. Then um, we'll ask you, uh, as we've already mentioned, to submit the agency remote testing agreement to both your program specialist and your regional consultant. Um, there we'll ask you to specifically list the ones that you're planning to deliver remotely and um, describe how you're going to revise, if you are, the assessment delivery for each of them. <clears throat> then uh, it's time for training and looking into rolling out. So we'll um, be asking you to train the assessors in the remote testing procedures. We're going to be providing you with support for that. The program specialists are working on uh, training webinars to um, guide you and um, give suggestions for that. So that's in the works as well right now. Um, we would ask you to do trial runs just between assessors. So before you launch it with students, try it with just uh, assessors role playing, uh, work out any kinks, and then uh, again, not don't go full scale until you've done a pilot with one or maybe two classes, just a limited number of students to just um, see, take it for a test drive and see uh, if you still need to make any other adjustments. And then um, when everything's ready, roll it out. Now, I mean, these steps, uh, you could do them very quickly. Um, and I, I know many of you are eager to get going, but we would encourage you to do all these steps uh, and not rush ahead without them.
Oh, I see. I'm sorry. There's a comment here which I will reinforce if not everybody has seen it that the teacher is not supposed to be the assessor whenever possible. So, uh, yes, please. Uh, then you will need to be um, looking into the identification of student, uh, verification of student identity. Um, you know, it may be as simple as just having the student uh, hold up their ID uh, or whatever, however you do verify their identity uh, so that that can be um, authenticated. We will ask you to have all assessors that are going to be doing remote testing with co-apps sign the simple form that you should keep on file that will um, uh, assure that they have agreed to all the privacy, security, all of these uh, remote testing guidelines. So that is uh, something just as a, another measure to ensure that the test security guidelines are being followed. <clears throat> Next slide, please. And uh, we're not gonna leave you high and dry. We're gonna um, give you the guidelines, which we hope will be as robust as, as they can be to give you initial guidance. Uh, the program specialists are, uh, as we speak, working on uh, webinars to guide you. Uh, and um, again, I'm not sure exactly when we'll be able to release those, but um, possibly uh, late next week or it's definitely by the uh, May 11th. And then we are already compiling FAQs about remote testing, and I'm sure that those are going to be um, uh, an, uh, a very dynamic and living document where we'll be adding as we uh, gather more questions. <clears throat> Next slide, please. So here are some tips um, just to kind of put a little bit of, um, of, a, of, a, of example, some examples to this uh, and make it a little bit more concrete. Uh, in terms of if you have co-op assessment deliveries that are written responses, um, that could be done on paper, as we were saying, while the assessor is watching, then the student could hold up the paper they've written on with their response and show it to the assessor. The assessor could take a photo of it uh, or just, just read it and confirm. <clears throat> um, there are some considerations, uh, and you may have already experienced some of these uh, constraints when you're having, uh, if a student is using something as small as a smartphone, that there's not a lot of re screen real estate. So, uh, and uh, it may be necessary for them to use line paper or to use something uh, darker than a pencil. Um, so you might have to advise them to use a medium tip dark pen or in, any, in other words, something uh, that'll be darker and easier for you to read. Um, so, uh, if the student has a computer and a cell phone, then uh, they could even be texting in real time while you observe that happening, or you're going to be getting the texts. Um, another uh, uh, tip is that um, for things like forms, which uh, perhaps a census form or uh, in the area of health, there are a number of forms, uh, you can make sure that the form has clear uh, numbering of, of the lines and that will help you to guide the student to a specific location on that uh, document and then uh, the student can use those reference numbers in their answers. So we can go to the next slide and there's a slide and there's an example of that. <clears throat> so on the left you can see this document that's adapted for the census questions. And then on the right is a um, fake student who uh, has dutifully answered all these, listed all the, the line numbers and then, uh, well, puts, puts, put their answers. So this is just a, an idea of one way of going about it um, with COAP 54. In terms of uh, oral responses, <clears throat> uh, again, it may be possible to use the assessment delivery in your current oral assessments using your, the same rubrics, you know, you'll have to see, um, depending on how you have written them uh, in your program, uh, that it may be possible just to be one-on-one -on -one with the student uh, or, or one to more than one if that's how you've set it up and um, recording the responses uh, using your rubrics. So uh, that's something you'll have to see. 
Um, we, again, would really like you to be able to view the student if that's possible with the devices and the uh, technology that they are able to get access to. Uh, and you can use any kind of video uh, app. Um, WhatsApp isn't there, but that's another one that's not even listed. So FaceTime, Skype, Zoom, any of them, just as long as both the student and the assessor have access to the same um, platform. Uh, if you're uh, using illustrations or pictures as a prompt, this could be for oral, it could also be for written or other kinds of um, prompts. Um, you need to make sure that they're going to display clearly on a phone if that's the medium that you're going to be using. Uh, you, we all know that those phone screens are quite small and so um, if you have uh, an assessment delivery in a co-op that has multiple illustrations that might not work. Uh, you might have to break it up into just one at a time uh, that's not too detailed. So all of these things uh, you'll need to, and this is this is the sort of thing that when you do your one-on-one uh, -on -one with assessors, you'll be able to detect uh, whether it's visible and you know when you do those uh, trials together you'll want to use the technology that your students have and make sure that um, what you're planning is going to work. Another consideration is font size. So uh, again, although the screen is small, you still need to make sure that the fonts are visible. And so you'll need to experiment with that and make sure that they're readable on the devices that you'll be using. Uh, here's an example of uh, some enlarged uh, font size. So you can see, I'm sure you can uh, have ways of working that out. All right, next slide, please. So just to summarize about co-apps, um, you know, this is new for all of us. Uh, we know we're going to learn a lot together as we look into this. Uh, you know, the, the co-app, uh, it, these uh, additional assessments are already so uh, creative and innovative. I know you uh, are, many of you, very proud of what you've developed at your programs. And I think now uh, is an opportunity to find some uh, additional innovative ways to uh, tweak them. And sometimes it may be just, uh, you know, by adding one more sentence to the instructions about hold it up to the camera so that the assessor can see that sort of thing. So, um, you know, you'll be able to hopefully without too much effort, uh, make these work. And we really would like you to be sharing your experiences. Your program specialists are going to be quite involved and we'll be pulling you together to um, share anything we uh, can share with you also to learn from each other and, and share statewide as well. So, um, if you would like to be part of this pilot between now and uh, basically the next week and a half or so, uh, please uh, let your program specialist know. And then if you do decide to do that, we definitely appreciate the help you're going to be giving us. Linda, it's Janice. There was uh, looking, agencies are asking questions about brainstorming ways using Google Forms or answering. One of the questions came up about recording. Is there any requirement for recording the students' responses, whether it's audio or video? Uh, CASAS does not have a requirement to record. <clears throat> and the reason, um, actually we initially explored that, um, but we backed off of it because we found that it was really challenging to figure out what to do with those recordings. And we also got a little bit concerned because we realized that um, although recording would document what happened, it also uh, can be challenging, we think, to uh, safeguard the recordings. And we might be opening up the um, assessments to uh, more danger than uh, they might otherwise be. So that's basically, we, we thought about it and we actually decided against it. And so uh, for those reasons, um, you really maybe ought to think twice before if you, uh, you know, think that uh, you want to do it. So it's, I, I don't know that, um, 
And I mean, Pat, you might want to weigh in here, but I, I don't know that we're necessarily prohibiting it, but we would really caution you strongly about some of the dangers of it. Well, this is Pat, and I agree with you, Linda. Um, I think as agencies look at their co-ops and look at um, what might be possible, um, they may decide that they want to record the first few so that um, they can comply with the requirement that at least one pass and one fail um, is stored so that when CDE does their FPM and comes out to their agency, um, they, can, they can actually see the full assessment of what is passed and, and what has failed. But I, I think it is um, a logistical problem uh, to, to record all of them. Thank you. Any other questions? I just want to mention um, that we will be also, when we uh, meet on Monday and talk about the pre-post testing, we'll also be addressing uh, recording. And just as a little preview, uh, we have decided against recording for the pre-post as well. So that is a change from what we had originally thought. But um, as I mentioned, it's a steep learning curve and we are um, you know, considering uh, new angles all the time. So uh, although we had originally thought about asking uh, the pre-post test to be recorded, we have backed off of that. And so now we're, we are not uh, wanting them to be recorded. So now we'll move into the SIT. Um, I don't know if all of you are familiar with the SIT, the citizenship interview test. Uh, it is a very different kind of test than co-ops because it is a, a secure standardized test that um, there are two forms, um, 973 and 974. It's a one-on-one -on -one oral interview that simulates the USCIS naturalization test. Um, it's not a pre-post test. It's a pass-fail test that is given at the um, end of uh, citizenship prep instruction to determine if a student is ready to uh, pass the, uh, the USCIS interview portion, not, not the knowledge part of the 100 questions, but whether they're able to um, handle the uh, oral part of that uh, interview. So, um, and, and at, it's after the 30 hours they can try if you think they're ready and they can retry and take the alternate form uh, if they don't pass. So I, I just want to be very clear that um, the things we're going to talk about for the SIT uh, are much more stringent, the requirements. And um, they're, we're talking about them today because they are um, uh, specific to EL Civics. But um, they are very different. Uh, there are different requirements for the SIT than the co-ops. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> So for the SIT, um, <clears throat> as I said, we think it's quite doable. Uh, the two possibilities are a phone with a video cam or a computer or tablet with a webcam and audio. Now, you will see that only a phone, uh, even a smartphone, um, well, sorry, just, just a phone without a smartphone is not an option for the SIT. So a smartphone with a video camera can be, uh, that is allowable, but um, a phone that does not have any video capability is not possible to use with the SIT. So um, if, you, if there are students that want to take it, maybe they can borrow a phone or somehow work it out that, or you can perhaps provide them with the technology to do this, but uh, we cannot allow the SIT to be given without some uh, real-time video observation. The platforms that are possible are open actually, but must be video platforms. So it could be Zoom, WhatsApp, Google Duo, Skype, or FaceTime, or any other platform that um, both the student and the student administrator have in common. So that's something for you to determine. 
um, but the, the platforms are more open, but the possible devices are, are um, there are restrictions. Next slide, please. So here's the going, going remote process for the SIT. Uh, we are piloting right now. I just want to uh, give a shout out to Jennifer Galliardi. Thank you so much for uh, your help in this first phase. Um, we've met twice with Jennifer and she's been, as you can well imagine, incredibly helpful in helping us think of things we hadn't thought of before. And she's been piloting with um, already. So thank you so much. Um, so, all right, the, the first part is to look at these uh, new CASA SIT guidelines for remote testing. I will explain that these are guidelines that are in addition to the SIT test administration directions. So um, those of you who are certified SIT administrators are masters of the SIT test administration directions, but now you will need to carefully study these SIT guidelines for remote testing and be, be um, you know, very, very familiar with them. Um, one of the interesting aspects of uh, rolling out the SIT remotely is that um, there's a the matter of the, the paper test booklet, which uh, has always been a paper. Uh, it's something that's consumable and the uh, test administrator uh, for every student fills it out, goes through the test asking questions and marking down the score according to the rubric zero, one, or two. So um, I don't know, some of you uh, who are SIT administrators may have left your school with copies of the uh, 973 and 974, in which case maybe you're all set. But we imagine there are a lot of SIT administrators who didn't do that. And so we have created and are still fine tuning, but we have created uh, a fillable PDF uh, version of these um, Form 973 and 974 test booklets. So just as you would use the paper, it would be a, an electronic form that uh, the, the SIT administrator would have on their computer and would be, uh, as you were asking the questions, you'll be marking the score as you go and uh, then saving it. And we'll have to give you, we will be giving you guidelines for how to save it, what to put in the file name. And then um, in this third bullet, you know, how do you enter that score in TE? How do you send it along? You know, what do you do with that fillable PDF? How do you store it? So this is things that the agency will have to figure out in terms of procedures for remote testing of the SIT to make sure that all of this is uh, secure and very orderly and clear. Uh, I know some, some SIT test administrators may have access to TE and can go in on their own and figure out um, uh, how to enter the score or if perhaps the student has already taken one form and failed it and needs to take the alternate form, you know, you need to check that and know which form to give. So you'll need to have press procedures for all of that uh, if the SIT administrator doesn't have their own access to TE. And then of course the technology, uh, we've talked about that. So um, in terms of certification, uh, the good news is that just for this year under the circumstances, uh, CDE, CDE has agreed to extend the deadline for the annual SIT recertification from April 30th today until the end of May. So please don't procrastinate, get to it if you haven't done it already. Um, you, I believe, know how to do that. It's uh, contacting Selenir flag, cflag at casas.org uh, to go through that process. Uh, we do insist that any uh, SIT remote testing be done by uh, certified SIT administrators. So they need to be either existing SIT administrators who then get trained in remote testing procedures. Uh, it could be people who have just completed their initial certification or who have been doing it for some time and have their recertification, but the, that recertification needs to be up to date. Um, and uh, some of you may wonder, um, there may be, I know that not very many, but there are some folks out there who 
are still, uh, you know, we're in the process of doing the initial certification or if, if as an agency you want to have additional uh, people go through that certification, um, we are uh, working out how to help those who have uh, uh, got stuck in the middle of that process, how to complete it remotely. And if you have people that you'd like to um, send to, to do that, uh, we can work with you on that. So um, we can figure out how to do it remotely. So, but it, it is really the, the most uh, essential requirement that they have to be certified to do it. <clears throat> Again, we have this agency remote testing agreement uh, that you'll submit and that will be on file. And then the similar steps as for co-ops, um, we uh, on uh, CASA staff will uh, be offering uh, some webinars to train existing SIT administrators in remote testing procedures. Uh, we'll be letting you know about those. Um, again, we would want you to try it out uh, between assessors before you uh, do it with students. Again, we don't want you to do it like with lots of students to begin with, just start it out with uh, a limited number and then, um, then go uh, to extend it to more. Uh, next slide, please. This is the document that is um, in development, but we're uh, making great progress and we'll have it ready by the end of next week. <clears throat> Next slide. Uh, and uh, as for the co-ops, we'd ask you to have all SIT administrators complete uh, a form that you'll have on file locally that will attest to their compliance with the uh, requirements of the uh, remote testing guidelines for SIT. <clears throat> uh, next slide. As for the co-ops, we'll have some uh, training tools that are specific to the SIT. That's the guidelines document. We'll have these webinars I just mentioned. And we will, um, we already have started FAQs. We'll keep going with those and um, make sure we keep them up to date. Okay. So anything, let's go back. Anything on the SIT? I see a question about the synchronicity of these assessments. Yes, they have to be live. I see there's a question about the fillable version of the test booklet. Um, we, once we complete and finalize these um, resources uh, and test forms, we will definitely uh, let you know. We, we know who all the um, certified SIT administrators are. Uh, we will ask you as an, uh, you know, when an agency submits the form to say that you're uh, interested in doing remote testing of the SIT or others, then that will also alert us to the fact that we need to share all these resources with you and how to get them. So just to let you know that um, this webinar has been recorded uh, and uh, the PowerPoint as uh, Melinda showed is already out there, but uh, we will be compiling the chat responses, uh, the chat box questions and responses and we'll make them available as soon as we can. Um, these resources will be on the OTAN website and um, Ned is going to show you that in just a minute. And also on the CASAS website um, in the California Adult Ed Accountability and Assessment section at that link. Um, again, if you're interested in pilot testing, please contact your program specialist and uh, that would be in the next week and a half. Um, and then from then on, we'll be working with you, uh, providing support in as many ways as we possibly can. Uh, just wanna say, we, we know you're gonna be creative. We know you're gonna be careful and uh, we're counting on you to do that. Okay, um, over to Neda. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, Dr. Zachary and CASA's team. I wanted to walk through the OTAN website and show everyone on the line um, where they're going to be able to find the PDF um, slides for today. So I'm gonna stop sharing the slides and I'm going to share the website. So if we go to the OTAN homepage, which is www otan.us. And the top story will always have your upcoming OTAN activities that support adult educators and it will list 
all of the offerings for the week. So you can see this was our co-op and citizenship in, remote, in, in a remote environment and some other upcoming um, webinars. But I also wanted to kind of take you to the COVID-19 field support page. And on this page, you'll be able to find the resource guide, how to access the training calendar and register for these upcoming webinars, including the one that's coming up on Monday on pre and post testing. But the handout for today will be the last one on the list for 430 co-op and citizenship in a remote environment. And you will see the PDF document right here. The video recording will be posted on this chart as well, along with if we compile um, some of the Q&A as you might also find it in this table as well. You can locate uh, resources from CalPRO, additional resources from CASAS, more resources from CDE, the Adult Education Office, and if you're looking for specific resources for students and some more additional resources here.